Chapter 3 In which Tom leaves for St. Mars and finds on the road thither that fun sometimes comes expensive. This interval of five months taught Tom several years, as it were, the prospect of preparing for his first communion and of going to a school where he would be thrown upon his own resources put a touch of earnestness, hitherto lacking, into his life in such wise that there came a change so perceptible even as to attract Mr. Meadows' notice. During the vacation, strange to say, Tom gave so little trouble that Aunt Jane entertained serious fears for his health. About thirty minutes past seven, on a Monday evening in September, Master Tom, enveloped in a linen duster which reached nearly to his heels, looking rather solemn and accompanied by his uncle, aunt, and father, stood silent in the Union Depot of St. Louis. Bells were ringing, engines were puffing, hissing and shrieking, tracks were rumbling and quivering, cars were moving in and out, newsboys, hackmen, and depot officials were shouting, porters were hurrying in every direction, throwing trunks and other baggage, now here, now there, in a manner most confusing to the inexperienced eye, Women and children were standing near the ticket offices, were sitting restlessly in the waiting rooms, some indulging in a hasty lunch, many looking hopelessly lost, while the multitudinous electric lights flared and sputtered over the whole scene. As train after train moved away for its long journey, and Tom realized that he too would soon be on his way to another part of the world, his heart grew heavy. "'I say, Pa,' he suggested, I guess I don't want to go. Pa smiled. Mr. Don't Want is not a member of our family, volunteered Mr. Meadow very smartly. Tom shot an indignant glance at the speaker of these cruel words. Keep up your courage, Tommy, whispered Aunt Jane, quietly pressing a silver dollar into his hands. It's for your own good, dear, and in ten short months you'll come back as a little man. The prospect of ten short months, and the resultant of a little man afforded him small consolation, but the silver dollar had a reassuring effect. Absenting himself from the family group, he immediately expended one quarter of his aunt's gift on a paper of caramels and a cream cake, and he was thinking very seriously of laying out twenty-five cents more in the purchase of a toy pistol, when a crowd of boys of all ages and sizes came pouring into the depot. Tom gazed at them in amazement. "'I say,' he said, addressing one of the boys about his own age, "'what's broken loose?' Instead of answering this question, the boy stopped and considered Tom attentively. "'Don't you belong to our crowd?' he at length said. "'What crowd?' asked Tom. "'The St. Mars fellows.' "'What?' cried Tom in amazement. "'Are all you fellows going there, too?' "'That's what they say.' "'Well, then, things aren't so bad as I thought they would be. "'I say, let's be partners. "'My name is Tom Playfair. "'What's yours?' "'Harry Quip.' "'Here, take some candy,' said Tom, opening his package. "'Harry embraced both offers. "'Henceforth he and Tom were partners. "'While the two were thus exchanging, "'small boy courtesies, "'a clean-shaven gentleman, somewhat beyond middle age, "'and attired in a clerical suit, walked up to them. Harry raised his hat and endeavored to compose his features. "'Well, Harry,' said the newcomer, "'who is this little friend of yours?' Tom, perceiving that the eyes of the gentleman were fixed upon him, became nervous, and, in endeavoring to bolt a caramel which he had recently placed in his mouth, nearly choked himself. "'This is Tommy Playfair,' said Harry. "'Oh, indeed. So this is the boy that runs after fire engines, is it?' "'Only did it four or five times in my life, father.' "'And gets himself on top of slippery roofs?' "'Tom only remarked. "'Please, father, I won't do it again.' "'Upon this the reverend gentleman who had charge of the boys "'laughed cheerfully and shook his new acquaintance's hand, "'and, cautioning both to take their places in the car which he pointed out, "'hurried away to see to the safety of the luggage. "'What's his name?' inquired Tom. "'That's Father Teeman. "'He's prefect of discipline at the college.' "'Discipline?' echoed Tom, with a vague idea of a cat-o'-nine-tails running through his head. 
What does that mean? It means he does the whipping. Oh, but he doesn't look so savage. He doesn't have to. But just wait till he catches you cutting up. He'll thrash you, so as you will prefer standing to any other position for a week after. Tom was appalled. His companion, could he only know it, was exaggerating grossly for the sake of enjoying a newcomer's surprise and terror. Does he thrash a fellow often? was Tom's next question. Well, I should say so. Last year I got whipped nearly twice a day. There was scarcely a week that I didn't go to the infirmary to lay up for repairs. Gracious! ejaculated Tom. I won't stand it. Harry, you and I are partners. I'll tell you what, let's do. Nobody's watching us. Let's slip out. I've got a dollar, and we can support ourselves on that. And we, when we get broke, we'll sell newspapers. Harry had no idea of encouraging Tom to run away. In his schoolboy idea of a good joke, he merely wished to put him in a state of dismal suspense. So he said, Oh, you didn't get scared. There's lots of fun out there. I don't see any fun in getting strapped once or twice a day. You won't get a strapping at all, maybe. I was such a dreadful hard case, you see. That's why I got it. Notwithstanding this avowal, it is but just to remark that Harry Quip's features, in their normal state, wore a very mild expression. Still, Harry's explanation did not succeed in disarming Tom's fears. If there were to be any wild boys at St. Mars, Tom, like Abu ben Adem, had substantial reasons for believing that his name would lead all the rest. He was about to press his proposition of running away with still greater earnestness when he heard his name called. "'Coming directly, sir. I say, Harry, you keep a seat for me next to you in the car.' And Tom pattered off to bid adieu to his father. "'Well, my boy,' said Mr. Playfair, catching Tom's hand, "'I'm about to put you into good hands. But you must be careful. You will now be thrown among all kinds of boys, good, bad, and indifferent. Remember that on your choice of company depends in great part your piety.' Teachers may instruct, priests may exhort, but if your company be bad, you will be no better. And don't forget that every day you are preparing for your first communion. That should be the day of your life. If you make a good first communion, you will be sure to get on well. So look out for your company, and try to be as good a boy as you can. Now, my dear child, be watchful on these points. As to the rest, I hold no fear. Here's something to keep your courage up, but don't spend it all at once. Tom took the advice in good part, and the five-dollar bill with effusive enthusiasm. Then, kissing his father, he turned to Aunt Jane. The kind lady could not repress a few sobs. "'God bless you, my boy,' she faltered. "'Be sure and write every week, and I'll pray for you every morning and every night so long as you're away.' and she handed him a basket laden with his favorite delicacies. Tom's eyes filled at these exhibitions of his aunt's kindness. "'I've been awful mean to you, Aunt Jane, lots of times, but I didn't intend anything, you know, and I'm sorry. When I come back I hope I'll be better, honor bright.' Even Mr. Meadow, yielding to the solemn influence of a parting scene, had purchased his nephew a red-covered book concerning an impossible boy who met all kinds of impossible adventures in an impossible country. "'Chicago and Alton Railroad! All aboard for Kansas City!' shouted a voice. "'That's for you, Tommy,' Mr. Playfair said. They all moved towards the cars indicated. An African-American in the official garments of the road met them halfway. "'Is he a college boy, sir? Step just this way, sir. I have the honor of taking charge of them. Come on, young gentlemen. Now up you go.' And without giving our hero an opportunity of making a farewell speech, he quickly raised Tom up on the platform, and in a manner quite gentle yet effective, pushed him into the reclining chair car. "'Here you are, Tom!' shouted Master Quip, who, faithful to his promise, had kept his friend a seat beside him. Tom hastened to occupy the vacant chair and seated himself as the train began to move out from the depot, 
while the boys gave three vigorous cheers. "'Ah, I like this,' said Tom, throwing himself back in his seat, yielding to the luxury of the hour. "'Jolly, isn't it?' Harry observed. "'Take a smoke,' and he offered Tom a cigarette. "'Well, no,' said Tom, with some hesitation. "'Why not?' "'Well, I'll tell you,' answered Tom, in a burst of confidence. "'I hate anything like a humbug, and if I was to smoke now, it would only be to look big. "'You see, I've got no liking for it. "'I've smoked once or twice up in Papa's hayloft, and it's always made me feel bad. "'So, you see, I don't like it, and I'd be a humbug if I pretended I did.' This was one of the longest speeches Tom had ever made, and it produced its impression. "'Well, you've got true grit, Tom, and I like you the better for what you've said. I like a smoke myself once in a while, but I'm pretty sure that half the little chaps who do it only do it to look big.' "'I'd rather be little than big,' said Tom. "'Why?' "'Oh, pshh! A man's got to shave. He's got to dress stylish. He can't play nor eat candy in the streets and lots of things.' "'That's so. Yes. And then half of them are stuck up, and they wear stiff hats and are afraid to run, and they don't play any games at all.' "'Yes,' assented Harry, and when the chaps grow up, they've got such a lot of worry about bringing out their mustaches. Both considered the subject pretty well exhausted. "'I say,' continued Tom, "'they're all boys in this car.' "'Yes, it's been chartered for our crowd. Do you know all of them?' I know some of the older boys. Who's that fellow with his coat collar turned so as to hide his ears and his hair sticking up like bristles, trying to smoke a cigar as if he were used to it? That's Johnny Shoestrings. Who? Johnny Shoestrings. That's his nickname, you know. He's such a slouch. I can't think of his right name. Who's that boy with the hair like a carrot banged all over his forehead and a pug nose and an awful big mouth? That's Crazy Green. "'Crazy Green?' "'That's what everybody calls him. "'He hasn't got any sense "'and doesn't know how to behave decent. "'In fact, I think he's a real bad boy.' "'Do all the fellows have nicknames?' "'asked Tom. "'All the old boys have except one. "'Who's that? "'His real name is Black, "'and it fits his color, "'so, well, we thought we'd let him keep it.' "'Who are those five fellows down there "'who look like they're each other's sisters? "'They're all so timid and pretty.' "'Newcomers,' answered Harry. "'Tom's eyes were fascinated by this group, "'and not being satisfied with the information Harry had vouchsafed, "'he went to the other end of the car "'where he could interview them personally. "'Having first satisfied himself "'by taking a deliberate survey of the five, "'much to their uneasiness and manifest discomfiture, "'he opened the conversation thus.' "'I say, hello!' "'The largest of the group, a boy about fourteen, answered timidly. "'How do you do, sir?' "'I ain't, sir. My name's Tom Playfair. What's your name?' "'Alexander Jones.' "'Whew! Five Joneses! Are any of you twins?' "'Harry and Willie are twins, sir.' "'There ain't any triplets among you, are there?' "'No, sir, not this time.' "'answered Alexander Jones, who, in his timidity, was accidentally facetious. "'Well, good-bye. Take care of yourselves.' "'And bestowing a genial grin upon the Jones brothers, he returned to his seat. "'The train, having now crossed the great bridge that spans the Mississippi "'and passed out of the city of Alton, was speeding along through the open country. "'Without, it was pitch dark.' and the sable solemnity of the night was enhanced by an occasional light that flashed before the eyes of the passengers at the windows, and then as quickly disappeared. "'I say, what kind of place is it?' asked Tom, resuming his conversation with Harry. "'What place? The gravy station? Is that what you call it?' "'Yes, they feed us on cornbread and gravy.' "'Don't you get any meat?' "'Oh, yes, they give us meat on Christmas.' And, New Year's, everyone gets a small piece of pie. Gracious! cried Tom, absently placing his hand on his stomach. But I suppose you have lots of holidays? Not so many, I can tell you. And then, even then, we've got to stay cooped up in a little yard that isn't large enough to swing a cat in. They're not going to treat me that way. When no one is looking, I'll slip out every chance I get. 
"'If you do,' said Master Quip, who was bent on scaring Tom to the utmost, "'you'll get collared by a prefect and then posted.' "'What do you mean, get posted?' "'Why, a great big prefect bangs you up against a tree-box or a post or a stone wall "'and tells you that if you move from it before three hours are up, he'll petrify you.' "'Tom groaned. "'I guess all my fun is over,' he muttered in a faltering voice. "'Oh, we have fun sometimes, you know.' "'How is that?' asked Tom anxiously. "'Why, we go out walking in ranks.' Two abreast on recreation days, with a big prefect walking in front and another big prefect behind us. Then we walk six miles or so, that is, we keep on walking till most of the little tads aren't able to stand any longer. We sit down and then rest for five minutes before we start walking back again. And then, while we are sitting down to rest, we are allowed to talk, you know. Why, can't you talk when you're walking? Not much, said Harry emphatically. And do you mean to say, cried Tom excitedly, that after five minutes they're able to walk back again? I didn't say any such thing. Are they left behind then? No, indeed. They always have a big hay wagon along, and when a fellow can't walk they tumble him in. But he's got to be mighty tired before that happens. So, said Tom, after a moment's reflection, that's what you call fun? Certainly. It's the jolliest kind of fun. "'I suppose you fellows consider a funeral a good joke.' "'Tom did not know that he was sarcastic. "'You're talking now,' said Harry. "'Whenever a boy dies, we get the night off studies.' "'Does a boy die often out there?' "'Harry ignored the literal meaning of this question as he answered, well, "'No, not as many as we would like. "'Only two or three a month.' W- "'What do they die of?' "'They don't die at all. "'They get killed by being hit over the head with a loaded cane.' Tom jumped up from his seat. "'Take it back!' he said with considerable fierceness. "'Take what back?' inquired his astonished friend, rising from his reclining position. "'You've been telling me yarns. Take it back, will you? Or you and I aren't partners any more.' "'Wow, I'm willing to take it back. I only did it for fun. Just wanted to rattle you a little. You needn't get mad about it.' Whether the conversation would have drifted is impossible to say— for as the train stopped just then at the station, Harry and Tom, with that natural curiosity to see and know all things which is the proud prerogative of the American boy, dashed out upon the platform. So satisfied they were with this new position that they resolved to keep it for the time indefinite, and accordingly squatted down on the side steps. They were not long there, however, when Father Teeman ordered them inside. Harry, suggested Tom when they had gained their proper positions, "'Let's have a little fun.' "'What are you thinking now?' asked Harry. "'Let's play conductor.' Harry glanced around the car dubiously. It was now after ten o'clock, and most of the boys, wearied with the excitement of the day, were asleep. "'What's the use?' he said. "'Nobody's awake.' "'All the better. "'Well, how will we do it? "'Do you see that lantern on the platform of the car?' "'Yes.' Well, that's the idea. Come on. Accompanied by Harry, Tom sallied forth, obtained possession of the lantern, and again walked into the car. Stealing up to a boy who was locked in slumber, he thrust the lantern into his face, and in as deep as voice as he could assume, said, Tickets, please. I haven't got it, cried the boy, jumping up and rubbing his eyes. I gave mine to father. He broke off when he perceived the grinning face of an unknown boy behind the lantern, and in great rage he leveled a blow at the joker. Tom, very naturally, held up his hands to protect himself, not taking into account that the lantern was in one of them. Crash! Out went the light, down clattered the glass in a hundred fragments. He had guarded himself very well, but the lantern was the worse for it. The youthful conductors stood aghast. "'Let's put the old thing back,' said Tom. "'Yes, and we'd better hurry,' counseled Harry. But before they could carry out their purpose, the porter came hurrying in. "'Young gentleman, who done took my lantern from the platform?' As he spoke, he glanced sternly at the discomfited culprits. "'I did,' said Tom. "'Here's the old thing. Looks like it's exploded, don't it?' "'Oh, muffins!' cried the porter." "'It's ruined, and I'll be discharged. "'You young bantams, what did you go and spoil my lantern for?' 
Tom, remembering the words of Scripture that a soft answer turneth away wrath, put his hand into his pocket and came out with it filled and said, Here, old fellow, take some candy. Sir, I doesn't want none of your candy. Unless I can get a lantern at the next station, I'm ruined. Can't you pay for it? Because if you don't, I'll report you to the company. How much do you want? asked Tom sadly. Four dollars, sir, said the conductor, smiling and muttering that he knowed they was gentlemen. I'll give you fifty cents, said Tom. Does you want to ruin a poor man? How does a dollar suit you? Can't afford it, sir, for less than two dollars. Well, I'll give you a dollar and a half, and we'll call it square. Seeing you're such a perfect gentleman, I'll take it, sir. And the conductor went away, rejoicing in a neat bit of profit. Boys, said Father Teeman, coming upon them from behind, suppose you go to sleep, or at least give the others a chance to rest. Get your chairs and keep them. I don't want any more fun tonight, said Tom, ruefully. Neither do I, said Harry. And the two innocents, falling back in their chairs, soon slept the sleep of the just.